Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have a very interesting discussion today about a topic that may seem a bit boring to start. Uh, but our goal here today is to make it not so boring and actually make it interesting. Uh, before we begin, for those of us who are not familiar with Secure World Foundation, we are an endowed private operating foundation dedicated to the long-term sustainability of space activities and the use of space for benefits on Earth. Um, I'd also like to give a thank you to Robert Baxter. He's the president of the Military Law Society here at GWU. They're a student organization uh, that's part of the law school, and they're helping us co-sponsor this event. Uh, and also a reminder that today's uh, discussion is on the record. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is how international law applies or doesn't apply to military activities in space. Um, there's a myth going around uh, that there is no law in space and that you can basically do whatever you want. Uh, in reality, there's actually quite a bit of international law that applies all over the where we have uh, human activities. Um, what's true is that to date, there has not been a lot of definition on how some of the existing international law applies or doesn't apply to specific activities in space, and military activities are part of that. Um, the speakers are going to go through uh, kind of an overview of what kind of what bodies of international law apply to military activities uh, and how some of the challenges have been tackled in other domains, such as drones, autonomous weapon systems, and cyber. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what the issues are in the space world and how we might try and take some steps uh, towards improving the situation. Um, the reason that we're bringing this up is that there are a number of initiatives going on at the moment, uh, uh, national, bilateral, and multinational, discussing space security, space safety, space sustainability. And in several of them, the issues such as what is the definition of self-defense have come up and emerged as a sticking point. <coughs> So we think that it's about time to try and have a, a more international discussion of what some of these issues are to try and perhaps at some point in the future uh, come to a resolution. Um, the goal for today is not to actually solve this entire problem, but more to establish some foundational concepts. Uh, when you first came in, you were given a couple of handouts. Uh, they're relevant to this discussion. The first one talks about the spectrum of law from peace to armed conflict, and the other one shows some examples uh, from the real world of cyber. They will be referred to by a couple different speakers during the course of the events. I'll just briefly introduce the speakers. You guys all have their full bios. Um, to my left is Wing Commander Duncan Blake from the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, next to him, Mr. Gary Brown, who's currently Head of Communications here in Washington for the International Committee of the Red Cross um, and is an expert in cyber law. Next to him is Dr. Cassandra Steer, Executive Director of the Air and Space Law Center at McGill University in Montreal. And finally, but definitely not least, is Dr. Peter Hayes, who is an adjunct professor here at GW University. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll give the floor over to the first speaker, Duncan, who is going to give us an introduction to the topic and a little bit, I believe, on autonomous systems. Thank you. Um, as Brian said, I'm a member of the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. I have to start with, uh, with a disclaimer, so I have to say um, the conclusions are my own um, in my personal capacity, not intended and should not be thought to represent official ideas or any agency of the Government of Australia, and I've used publicly available information. We've got that out of the way. Um, so you have a legal framework graphically represented on the handout in front of you, and that is, is as applicable in the land, sea, air, space or cyber domains, state activities leading up to and during war that have been conducted on land are relatively easy to characterise by reference to legal concepts within that framework. It's not been as easy to characterise those activities in other domains. Um, this is especially true in respect of the application of the Law of Armed Conflict, or LOAC, which is the lex specialis, a Latin phrase indicating that it is the body of law specifically applying in given circumstances, in this case armed conflict, and which displaces other laws that would normally be, be applicable to the extent of any, consist any inconsistency. Manuals of international law in various domains have made a very substantial contribution to clarifying the application of LOAC, and before we go any further, 
it is important to give a brief introduction to the background of these manuals. Um, from the mid-19th century to early 20th century, which was a very formative period for this area of law, there were many attempts to bring states to consensus on new instruments to expand the application of LOAC. Then, as is still the case now, states were wary of anything that appeared to limit their military options and capabilities, wary of apparent arms control instruments. However, one particularly erudite individual, Gustav Moynier, one of the founders of the Red Cross movement and of the Institute of International Law, realised that the challenges of developing new law about technical aspects of weapons need not stand in the way of clarifying existing law about behaviour in the context of armed conflict. And those two distinctions need to be emphasised. The first is the distinction between developing new law and clarifying existing law. And the second is the distinction between regulating technical aspects of weapons versus defining lawful and unlawful behaviour. Gustav Mornier proposed and led a gathering of international legal experts to draft a manual um, clarifying the application of existing LOAC to the conduct of warfare. And in 1880, a group of international legal experts drafted the Oxford Manual in relation to the laws of war on land. He led another group in 1913 to draft a second Oxford Manual in relation to the laws of naval warfare. Given the status of the international legal experts, their independence from parochial interests of states, and their rigorous adherence to clarifying the existing law rather than seeking to progressively develop the law, these manuals had a big impact on compliance with the existing law. They were successful in their, uh, their express primary objective of providing commanders with a practical aid for the exercise of distributed command and control, especially in the context of a revolution towards manoeuvre warfare. Nevertheless, that approach was not repeated until the San Remo Institute of International Humanitarian Law initiated an effort in 1988 to produce a new manual of international law applicable to armed conflict at sea. Again, the primary audience has been commanders, especially naval commanders, and you only need to ask a few of them to assure yourself that the San Remo manual is very well known. The San Remo manual has also been very influential among legal ex experts and in courts and tribunals. Thus, in both respects, it's been a big success. In 2006, an academic centre at Harvard University initiated a project to draft a similar manual, known as the Manual of International Law Applicable to Air and Missile Warfare, and also known as the Harvard Manual. And I'll make some reference to the Harvard Manual. In late 2009, a group of international legal experts was brought together at the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defence Centre of Excellence in Tallinn, Estonia, to discuss the legal framework applicable to hostilities in the cyber domain. They immediately rejected the need for development of new law and proposed instead to draft a manual of international law applicable to cyber warfare. The Tallinn Manual was completed in 2013 and Colonel retired Gary Brown is very qualified to talk about it. Um, back to the handout in front of you. There is a spectrum of activity and behaviour from peace to armed conflict and there is a legal regime for peace and a legal regime for armed conflict. Peace is the usual preferred state of affairs. Armed conflict is an aberration from that state of affairs and is a legal term of art. It encompasses use ad bellum, the law about the resort to force by states. Armed conflict also encompasses use in bello, or the law about how individual soldiers, sailors and airmen conduct themselves in conflict. And it's also known as LOAC, international humanitarian law and the law of war. There are slight distinctions between those three terms depending on the context in which they're used, but we don't need to go into that right now. Where the legal regime for peace ends and the legal regime for armed conflict starts is uncertain. Within each of the regimes, they are stratified by reference to legal concepts that can, can be grouped as either actions by an initiating state on the left on your handout or reactions by a responding state on the right on your handout. The handout is a simplification of the relationship between concepts, and I've attempted to provide a graphical aid to understanding 
but the legal concepts do not necessarily map out as neatly as the handout has, might suggest. The first state may be behave in a way that is unfriendly but not unlawful, and the other state may respond by conveying its displeasure, including in a formal diplomatic note known as a day marche. Flying along the edge of another state's national airspace and collecting signals intelligence is unfriendly but not unlawful. Alternatively, the other state may engage in what diplomats call retortion, that is, unfriendly actions of their own that are nevertheless still compatible with all the international obligations owed by that state. For example, using an aircraft to broadcast propaganda to fishing boats in the exclusive economic zone of another state is certainly unfriendly and may or may not be a breach of the state's international obligations, depending on what treaties it has ratified and the frequencies that it uses. Actions by the first state that may be characterised as internationally wrongful acts involve a breach of an obligation owed by a state regardless of the source of the obligation. So it could be a breach of a treaty obligation or a rule of customary international law or an interference with a state's sovereign rights. The last one requires a bit more of an explanation. By virtue of its sovereignty, a state may provide for its own well-being and development free from domination of other states, provided it does not itself impair or violate the legitimate rights of other states. Or to put another way, uh, a state is free to do whatever it wants, provided it doesn't interfere with other states. Anything that takes away this freedom is an interference with a state's sovereign rights. For example, a state is free to fly along the high seas side of another state's national airspace and even free to spy on, on other states from that position. Rule 119 of the Harvard Manual talks about espionage specifically in the context of armed conflict and you can have a look at that if you want to know more. If the aircraft is prevented from seeing anything useful because of camouflage or because lots of very bright lights were turned on, drowning out the picture, then too bad. It has not been prevented from doing something it is free to do. There is no right to useful intelligence, generally, and there, there's an exception to that, and we can talk about that if we have time. In order to be characterised as unlawful, the in interference must be so forcible that it effectively deprives that state of any real choice in the matter. Economic or political coercion does not amount to unlawful interference. An aircraft flying along the edge of the national airspace of another state that jams <coughs> propaganda broadcasts within that state thereby violates the sovereignty of that other state. A state is free to broadcast what, it's li what it likes within its own borders. If a state commits an internationally wrongful act, the other state will have a right of action in an international legal tribunal. This could include the International Court of Justice at The Hague or specialised tribunals such as the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which sounds like a very civilised and ideal way of responding to an internationally wrongful act, but it can take years to get a matter before such a tribunal and then still more years for the parties to argue the matter um, and then many months for the tribunal to make a decision. That is supposing that both states are subject to jurisdiction of the tribunal and that both states accept the decision. Even in that case, there is often little that can be done to enforce decisions of the tribunal if the decisions are regarded as legally binding and enforceable on the parties in any event. Given these many limitations, the majority of international disputes are not settled before international legal tribunals, but by other means. In response to an internationally wrongful act, a state may also, of course, take protective measures. That is, actions that only have an impact on themselves. Thus, if a military aircraft keeps getting blocked in international airspace in spite of freedom of navigation, the, the state could choose to use a stealth aircraft instead to avoid detection. The right to take protective measures seems obvious, but it is worth stating because the question does sometimes come up. The other state may take countermeasures in response to an internationally wrongful act. This is a legal term of art not to be confused with the way in which the military uses the term countermeasures, as in electronic countermeasures. In a legal sense, countermeasures means that the other state may lawfully decide to stop performing an internationally, international obligation owed to the first state on the basis that doing so 
will induce the first state to stop its internationally wrongful act. There are a number of criteria for the lawfulness of countermeasures. They must be directed at the wrongdoing state. You can't direct them at third states. There must be a prior demand to cease and a genuine offer to negotiate, but in the meantime you can take action to protect yourself. The countermeasure must be commensurate with, a, with or proportional to the original wrongdoing. The countermeasure cannot involve the use of force, uh, and that leaves some discretion about the best course of action in the circumstances. So, for example, some responses to the interception and turn back of a state aircraft would be lawful countermeasures, and some responses would be unlawful. It would, would not be a lawful countermeasure to create a large exclusion zone around the state aircraft <coughs> such that it interferes with the freedom of navigation of third states. It would not be a lawful countermeasure to shoot down the intercepting aircraft because a countermeasure cannot involve a use of force, although shooting down the intercepting aircraft might be lawful in other circumstances depending on the nature of the threat posed by the intercepting aircraft, and I will say more about that later. It might be considered disproportionate to block all scheduled and non-scheduled civil and other flights from the intercepting state into the intercepted state. However, it would probably be a lawful countermeasure to disallow scheduled civil flights from the intercepting state to selected airports in the intercepted state, notwithstanding the existence of a bilateral treaty between the two states allowing for access. There is another response to an internationally wrongful act that would itself amount to an internationally wrongful act, but which is excused in the circumstances, and that is distress. Distress describes the right of a state's agent to take reasonable measures in a situation of peril to save their lives or the lives of other, other persons entrusted to their care. Um, I won't go into this in more detail for the purposes of time, but the classic example is when a US EP-3 aircraft was damaged in interception involving a Chinese aircraft in international airspace on the 1st of April 2001, and the EP-3 crossed into Chinese airspace and landed on Hainan Island without consent. Some actions may be more than an internationally wrongful act and may also amount to a threat or use of force. Um, Article 2.4 of, of the Charter of the United Nations says that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So force is generally thought to involve armed force, violence and kinetic effects. The ICJ in the oil platforms case said that it's, it's more than a border skirmish but could be less than an armed attack, the implication being that there are some uses of force that do not give rise to a right to take action in national self-defence. The US took the contrary position in that case um, that any use of force would give rise to a right to respond in national self-defence. The political issue at stake is that if you set the threshold too low, then um, conflicts are starting in circumstances when they perhaps don't need to. If it's set too high, then you've got an unreasonable expectation of, of states restraining themselves. Not all activities are clear conventional acts of violence, and the ICJ in the Nicaragua case said that it was a matter of scale and effects. And that concept has been expanded upon, and a number of criteria suggested, specifically severity, immediacy, directness, invasiveness, measurability of effects, military character, state involvement, and presumptive legality. Um, so consider a remotely piloted aerial system uh, that's conducting daily surveillance along a land border. The other state is aware of these surveillance flights and knows that the uh, ARPAS has no weapons on board. If one day the ARPAS happens to slightly drift into the national airspace of another state, it would be difficult, difficult to argue that that amounted to a use of force. Consider, in contrast, four armed fighter jets off an aircraft carrier sitting 13 nautical miles off the state's coast that turn abruptly and cross into the state's national airspace at right angles, fly almost all the way to the coast and then immediately return to the aircraft carrier. 
without doing anything. Um, it would be easy to make the argument that such an activity amounts to a threat of force, but it may be difficult to make the case that it amounts to an armed attack. Often it will depend on the circumstances and a consideration of the factors that I mentioned previously. Generally, there's no right to react with force in response to an initial action that amounts to a threat of force. There are three exceptions. The first is where it also rises to the level of an armed attack. The second um, is, is controversial, and I'm not actually going to go into it now for purposes of time. Um, and the third is the doctrine of necessity. Uh, necessity is the right of a state to take reasonable measures to safeguard an essential interest of the state against a grave and imminent peril. Um, an example might be where a large surveillance, remotely pilot aerial system with no weapons on board, flies into another state's territory and over a populated area. It is shadowed by a fighter aircraft and when the RPAS suffers a malfunction that puts it on a flight path towards a school, the fighter aircraft destroys the RPAS at a time that would cause the wreckage to fall in a sparsely populated area. Sometimes the application of the doctrine of necessity can be very close to the right of national self-defence. And that's set out in Article 51 of the Charter. <coughs> If a state suffers an actual armed attack or anticipates an armed attack, then that state has a right to take action to defend itself and to call upon other states to assist. An actual armed attack is straightforward. Anticipatory self-defence is more difficult and it applies where the necessity of self-defence is instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment for deliberation. Preemptive or preventative actions cannot be justified as anticipatory self-defence. The threshold for an armed attack is high and you look at the same sort of factors that I discussed previously and it needs, the response needs to be necessary and proportional. Um, Article 51 contemplates that a state may act in national self-defence until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. So in the first place, um, that would be uh, measures not involving the use of armed force, which could be um, complete or partial interruption of economic relations of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraphic, radio, or other means of communication, and the severance of diplomatic relations. And if that doesn't work, then authorising actions by air, sea or land forces. The constraints that come from a UN Security Council res resolution are found in the first instance in the resolution itself. So even if you get a resolution that uses the magic words, all necessary measures, that's not carte blanche. You have to look at the resolution um, to determine what necessary means, because necessary is a relative word, necessary to what end. Um, and it's not just a matter of the resolution itself either, because there's a lot of intersecting law and the job of legal advisers to the armed force, forces becomes very, very complex when you're trying to deal with the intersection of a Security Council resolution, host nation law, domestic law, law of armed conflict, laws specific to a domain, and so on. Once we're in a position of responding to an actual or anticipated armed attack, um, or in circumstances where there's a resolution, then we're undoubtedly in a situation where, armed, where there's an armed conflict and law of armed conflict applies. Um, exactly where that point is can be difficult, but once it does apply, then um, it prohibits attacks on civilians and civilian objects and people and objects with special protection, such as hospitals, even if there are enemy wounded inside. However, there are circumstances where such persons and objects may lose their protection, such as where they directly participate in hostilities or are used for military purposes. It prohibits the attack prohibits attacks that would cause excessive collateral damage. It prohibits weapons, means and methods of warfare that would cause widespread, long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. It prohibits states from using civilians and civilian objects as shields. 
The Harvard Manual explains the application of those and many other principles of LOAC to air and missile warfare in detail. Um, that's sufficient for now as an introduction for the other three speakers. Uh, there's not sufficient time to talk about aggression and the crime of aggression, although it's on your handout. But please ask at the end if you want to, uh, if you're curious about that. Um, and thanks for your time, and I look forward to your questions later. Thanks. Thank you, Duncan. Um, we're now going to turn to Mr. Gary Brown, uh, who's going to talk about what, how some of this has panned out in the cyber world and his experience in putting together the Twin Manual. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. I thought maybe they had arranged us intentionally to go military guys, you know, kind of down here, and then the professors up here, but Duncan, you set the bar really high. So uh, everybody <laughs> cut me a break here. I'm the dumb cyber guy in the middle. I, I really don't know anything about space law, so you tell me how cyber uh, uh, is analogous to space, and I'll, uh, I'll listen intently. What I can do is tell you a little bit about the development of cyber law and where we are there. <clears throat> I'll, I'll kind of break it up into... Uh, into three parts, and then I have one bonus segment if I get through the first three fast enough. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit about the Talon Manual first, and then a little bit about what constitutes cyber warfare, uh, some about the law that applies once you're in uh, armed conflict, and then the secret bonus issue last. This is the uh, Talon Manual that was uh, we've been referencing a little bit already. This is, uh, was the work of, of a long time, and a lot of, a lot of smart people on it, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be there watching smart, <coughs> smart people at work. And, uh, um, it's, I think it's been quite valuable, and it's been uh, talked about a lot in the international community for, uh, for good reason. First of all, it really, uh, and we knew this when we talked about it uh, in Tallinn, it really doesn't have a lot to do with the activity that's going on in cyberspace right now, because we very intentionally made it focus on uh, war, cyber warfare, and not just cyber operations. So there are a lot, most of the things that happen now fall far below the level of anything that we would characterize as armed conflict. So none of that is covered in this manual. This manual talks about the stuff above the line. But the idea was, hey, let's get the, the easy part, the easy part on paper, and then we can talk about the hard part later. So this was the focus of the manual. The reason I think it's gotten a lot of attention, I mean, it's just a, a bunch of scholars putting together a book. It's nothing, it's, it doesn't represent the opinion of any nation or any, any bigger organization. It's just a scholarly manual. But I think the reason it's gotten a lot of attention is we really are hungry for law in cyberspace. So I, I guess this is much like space. Some people have argued that there is no law in cyberspace. Uh, and, you know, uh, maybe they're right, but uh, what, we, what we have is uh, a lack of treaty law. We have a lack of agreement among states about what, would be, what should be the, uh, the what should be normative behavior in cyberspace, what should be uh, appropriate or inappropriate in cyberspace, and most importantly, we have a lack of national practice that we can look to to develop customary international law. And the reason we have a lack of national practice is, of course, that activities undertaken by states, which is where we get customary law, right, from the actions of states, not from individual actors, the actions of states in cyberspace are secret. Nobody owns up, even when it's printed in the New York Times, uh, attributed <laughs> to certain states when activities happen. Still, uh, states don't own up to, to what they did. So there's been almost nothing that's been a, uh, officially attributed to a state. So we have a real hard time developing customary law in this area. A as a result, uh, this really, the Tallinn Manual really filled a void because we didn't have any law. So people are looking at it to at least a reasoned opinion about what the law ought to be. Now, how useful that is going forward is I, uh, I don't know, because as I said, most of the activity that's happening is below the level that the Tallinn Manual covers. But again, it's a start, I think. It is a, it is a start. So uh, the, the next uh, thing I'll talk about a little bit is how we get to war in cyberspace. This is a, this is a tough issue. You know, we, sometimes it's easy. If you already have a, uh, an armed conflict going on, which, uh, you know, unfortunately there are many of them, uh, generally at any given time. It's, uh, it's understood, and I think uh, rightly understood, that cyber activities will be part of the tactics that are used inside armed conflict. And of course, there isn't really any, any conversation or any, any uh, discussion or disagreement about the fact that LOAC, the law of armed conflict, would apply to those activities. You're inside an armed conflict, anything you do, if you drop a bomb, the law of armed conflict applies. If you, use, if you employ cyber methodology, law of armed conflict applies. And that's fairly easy and fairly straightforward. The, uh, 
problem is we don't always know when we get to armed conflict if there isn't a kinetic pre-existing armed conflict. So the, one of the big questions that plagues us, I think, is the, uh, the danger that since we don't know where the line is that there might be an unintentional escalation or an unintentional uh, cyber warfare that could result down the road when somebody was just trying to do uh, something at a much lower level but it ended up being interpreted by their uh, adversary as something much higher that results in, uh, in real armed conflict, uh, in a kinetic armed conflict. So uh, in this regard, we have problems with both. Uh, of course, the attribution part makes it a problem when we're trying to figure out if something is an international armed conflict, an armed conflict between two nation states. Um, even more difficult is determining whether or not something would constitute a non-international armed conflict, which would be an armed conflict between a nation state on one side and an organized armed group on the other side. The international law in this area is that that, that uh, organized armed group, that non-state armed group, has to have a certain level, we're not exactly sure where it is, but you know, we know it when we see it, a certain level of uh, organization uh, before they can qualify, and there has to be a certain level of intensity of the violence in the uh, armed conflict. And, and you can already see the problems with trying to apply that in cyberspace. What kind of organization do we have? Generally speaking, cyber actors are loosely organized across the internet, which is a wonderful, wonderful communications platform for, uh, or, for armed groups. And they can organize loosely, maybe not even meet in person, but coordinate their activities. Does that qualify as an organized armed group? Not under the traditional uh, way of looking at it. It doesn't, but maybe it will in the future. And what about uh, the intensity of violence? What kind of violence results from cyber warfare? Well, I don't know. Sometimes there can be consequences that result from cyber activities, but many times we just think about things happening electronically or entirely contained within cyberspace, and it's difficult to, to lay a violence definition on most of those things. So that, that can be quite difficult just to get to that, uh, to that level. And of course we have the, the uh, overarching problem, which is one I think also you have in space, of the attribution uh, or non-attribution of activities in cyberspace generally. So if an activity happens, we, we're not quite sure whether it came from a state, we don't know whether it came from an individual, and even if we can trace back, which you've seen, maybe, maybe you've seen some of the reports if you're into to, uh, cyber space activities uh, from companies like Mandiant who have reported back in very great detail about the origin of certain uh, cyber events and traced them all the way back to the computer and had taken pictures with the, uh, with the webcam on the, on the uh, computers and given the home address and the girlfriend and everything else to the people who are responsible for these activities, some of whom, as it turned out, happened to be in the, in the uh, Chinese army. Um, but what does that tell you? It tells you that you found a person who does an activity. It doesn't necessarily, in every case, tell you what organization is behind the activity. It just tells you the individual, and it doesn't necessarily tell you what the organization's uh, motivation was. So not even that, we're not quite sure uh, uh, whether we're going to get to armed conflict. Okay, so the third point is, once we're inside an armed conflict, there are big issues, too. I, pick a couple of, I picked a couple of my favorites to talk about. There are many, many more. I'm happy to talk about whichever ones you would, would happen to want to talk about. One of them is just the definition of an attack inside armed conflict. So we're in an armed conflict, and now we're trying to decide, does this cyber activity constitute an attack or not? Well, most of the time in the kinetic world, when we think about bombs and bullets, we're pretty clear on what constitutes an attack, right? But in the cyber world, not so easy. And, and the, the way we chose in the uh, Talon manual and the working definition we used when I was at Cyber Command uh, focused on the uh, reasonable expectation of injury or death damage or destruction. So some of those things. Very, we're looking at kinetic results to get to the definition of attack for the most part. The big debate that resulted in Talon from this was the idea that perhaps uh, if we, if we uh, interfere with the functionality of a system, maybe that should qualify as an attack too. So this is kind of unique to cyber. We don't normally think of just interfering with functionality as being an attack or a violent activity. But if we just make something not work, maybe that could be an attack. Um, is that true? I don't know if it's true or not. It gets to be very difficult. One of the, uh, one of the examples I put on, the, uh, on this chart, which is my pretty chart, two pretty charts here, I'm sure, um, is the, the Sony hack, which uh, most of you have heard about. Uh, most of the, of the uh, smart, unclassified people that I talked to um, about the Sony hack told me that what it, what it uh, essentially consisted of was going into hard drives on the Sony system and uh, as essentially disrupting or destroying the master boot record on hard drives. If you're, a, if you're a computer guy, you know what that means. 
If you're not, I can tell you it's essentially the same as being in a file room with a billion files in it that aren't filed in any particular order, but you have this piece of paper that tells you where all the files are, and somebody tore your piece of paper up. So now all your files are still there. Nothing's, nothing's been destroyed other than this index, but you can't really find anything. You can pop, pop, probably, probably, uh, reconstruct the master boot record with a deep forensic analysis if you have the time and the money to do that, but for the most part it's not really worth it because you've also got somebody inside your system and who knows if they're still going to be sitting there when you're finished reconstructing the uh, master boot record. So is that is that an attack? What was destroyed? Your stuff's still there. It's all still there. All the ones and zeros still uh, reside on the drive. You just can't find anything. I don't know. They're hard questions, uh, difficult, and I think not quite the same as they are in the kinetic world. Um, the other, uh, quickly, one of the things I'll talk about is just cyber disruption in general, and that is uh, really take, having very specific effects on people's lives in their everyday lives without anything being destroyed. So you can think of things like if uh, the train switching system were disrupted, not to, not to make trains crash, but just to, to uh, make it so uh, we don't trust the, the uh, reliability of the switching system, so we have to stop all rail traffic in the United States because we're not sure if they'll crash, so let's stop all the rail traffic. Or what if we... Uh, what if at uh, the ports of, of Baltimore, Long Beach, and Galveston, somebody got into the uh, computer system that had the manifests of all the container ships coming in and shuffled all the manifests so we had to physically crack open every container on the ships and find out what was inside before they were dispatched from the port? What do you think that would do to uh, people's lives here in the United States? Again, nothing destroyed. Nothing destroyed. Things just moved around. So th those disruptive actions are difficult to characterize under traditional international humanitarian law. Um, just not so easy. Uh, the second one, and I only want to take another minute or two, uh, the, the second one uh, issue that I'll talk about under uh, once you're inside an armed conflict is the, the difficulty of deciding what the means and methods of cyber warfare are. Uh, you generally considered to be pretty easy in kinetic warfare, but in cyber quite difficult. When you think about it, what exactly do you point to when you think about a cyber attack? If somebody's ha taken an aggressive cyber action, what is it you're going to point to to review for compliance with the law? Is it the computer? Is it the keyboard? Is it the hard drive? Is it the network itself? Is it the internet? Is it what, what is it exactly that constitutes the weapon? And the reason this is particularly difficult in cyber uh, is that many activities undertaken by criminals and hackers and, and anybody else that, that undertakes this kind of nefarious activity uh, is something you, you might broadly refer to as command line tactics. So we gain uh, unauthorized access to a network or a system. So now you, you're logged on as administrator. Someone is logged on as administrator to your system. And now they own your system. They can do whatever they want with it. They can read your mail, delete your mail, copy your mail, change your mail, or delete uh, all your files. Or, in some cases, even destroy, physically destroy your machine. So is the fact that they're physically resident on the machine, uh, first of all, is that an attack in itself? And if it's not, which thing is it that they're using that constitutes a weapon? Which thing? Is it their, their fingers? I, you know, I don't know. It's difficult to fit in this traditional uh, framework. And, I, you know, I don't really have time, but I'm going to tell you the bonus issue anyway. And I'll, just very quickly, I think the, one of the hardest things to deal with in, in uh, the law of cyber warfare is distinguishing between espionage and military activity. Very, very challenging. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, the, the U.S. Air Force, my former service, uh, took the easy way out, which was just saying, here's the definition of attack, and this, all these things are attacked unless it's done for espionage purposes. Well, I mean, that, that uh, to me is the easy and not very effective way out because, of course, the person on the other end of the activity has no idea what your intention is uh, behind doing it. But I, but I don't know that anybody has a better definition that's been able to distinguish those two. I think it's a conversation we need to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Steer, who's going to talk uh, about some of the challenges we face in the space world. So... Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times, you know, people kind of question whether there is even any law in space. I don't know how many space law specialists there are. How many people here are familiar with space law as a specific background? Okay, great. So there are some people here backing up. There is actually law in space. Um, and I'm going to give a brief introduction of the, the, the general principles of what applies in space law. Um, and then talk about the militarization of space, which is very controversial, and to what extent the law of armed conflict or law act does or doesn't apply, or to what extent we know whether it applies. And then finally, what um, a manual on the application of international law to military activities in outer space might contribute. So the basic principles of space law relating to military activities in particular. So we have... In 1963, um, 
the UN already sat down soon after Sputnik was launched. There were already activities in space. The UN uh, sat down and came up with some general principles governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space. And these principles led to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which is kind of our core treaty when it comes to what's, what's our basic public international law, specifically in the environment of space. And you could say that the object and purpose of that treaty is to maintain the peaceful exploration and use of outer space. It was to prevent an arms race, essentially. If you look at the, the time within which this was the beginning of the Cold War, it was to prevent an arms race in outer space, um, to ensure the freedom of access by all states to the use and exploration of space. And there were also a lot of ideals already stated in that treaty saying, and any kind of scientific information that one state may gather should be made available to all states. It's about a collaborative, cooperative environment. Um, the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and yes, that's a thing, as is the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. People don't believe me, but it exists. Um, it's, it focused for a long time on how to... Uh, so we have the general principles, we have a few treaties governing outer space, but after a certain short burst of treaty making, it kind of came to a bit of a deadlock. And the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space has attempted over time to keep developing that law, particularly as our technology develops, um, as has the, um, the, the, the CD in the UN. But it's been deadlocked for several years for political reasons. So we've had repeated General Assembly resolutions over several decades called the Pyros uh, resolutions or the Prevention of Arms Race in Outer Space. But as we know, General Assembly resolutions are non-binding. They're aspirational. They're kind of an expression of what we all generally agree to, but they're non-binding. Um, so what do we have in terms of binding law? Well, Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty lays down, as I mentioned, the freedom of use and exploration of outer space for all states for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, so also the attempt to include non-spacefaring nations, um, and shall be the province of all mankind. Meaning, as is laid down in Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty specifically, space can't be claimed as any state's territory. It's not possible to appropriate space. So it's this non-territorial, and a lot of people... Um, make the analogy to the high seas, nobody can claim that as their property. It's the province of all of humankind, which also means we all have to take care of it. Um, Article 3 says, and all of that exploration and, and free use that we all have has to, be, uh, has to be done in accordance with international law. So that includes the Charter of the United Nations, that therefore includes you know, Article 2.4, our use codes against our uh, use of force. Um, and it's stated in Article 3, it must be in the interest of maintaining international peace and security and promoting international cooperation and understanding. So it's all this kind of against an arms race, against having space become a new battlefield, which was already foreseeable. Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty specifies that it's a, a prohibition of weaponization and specifically nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. Um, we cannot place them in orbit, we cannot station them on any celestial bodies, which includes the moon, planets, things floating around up there, um, or in any other manner. So they try to be as broad as possible, but the question remains, what amounts to a weapon of mass destruction? Could we have smart weapons which aren't weapons of mass destruction, which might fall through a loophole there and suddenly be acceptable in outer space? Uh, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty states that all states are responsible for their activities in outer space, including the activities of non-state actors for which they're responsible. And Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty gives a fairly weak um, obligation, although it's the one that people tend to reach through the most often, that all activities have to be um, executed with due regard for the corresponding interests of other states. So, if a state believes that the space activities of another state would cause potentially harmful interference with activities in the peaceful exploration and use of outer space, outer space um, it can request consultation. So, there's an obligation, but it's a kind of weak obligation under Article 9. <coughs> space law is a part of public international law. So, everything that we know in internet public international law, everything we know about the law of armed conflict, generally applies. Um, you know, as Duncan has mentioned, we have Article 2.4 uh, in the UN Charter and all of the use codes and norms. 
We have the possibility, the only two exceptions to Article 24, of course, are self-defense, Article 51, or if the Security Council um, allows it under a resolution for collective self-defense, um, the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law applies in general, but we still have questions about how that applies specifically to the space environment. And you can think also about environmental law, particularly if you think about the kind of targeting that might take place in space. Um, when you're talking about satellites, as soon as you destroy something out of space, the kind of space debris that gets created is incredibly hazardous. I'm sure most people here have seen the film Gravity. One of the things I liked about that film was the whole premise is it's not big scary aliens coming together that are our greatest threat in our nearest space environment. It's the junk that we've created out there. So let's talk a little bit more about the militarization of outer space, which is a controversial term. Um, really, we should be talking about the weaponization of outer space because that is what is prohibited. That's very clear. But military technology has always been involved in our exploration of outer space. Um, and the use of space as a strategic domain for conflict or defense uh, here on Earth. Um, so there's a big debate when I mentioned in Article 3 the underlying core principle that our exploration and use of outer space has to be for peaceful purposes. There's been a debate for quite some time whether that excludes military use in toto or only aggressive purposes. So can we have military technology out there that's not doing aggressive things? Um, one example might be monitoring another state uh, as to whether or not they are developing a nuclear arms project. So it could be for defensive or monitoring or, in fact, peaceful purposes, but using military technology. Um, and if you think also about GPS, I've had to use Google Maps to find my way here to the university. GPS was a military technology originally, and it's been expanded for civilian use. Um, by comparison, the Russian GLONASS system and the European Galileo system, and I believe also the Chinese system, were originally civilian. But... The technology started out as military technology. So, the prevention of a space arms race was very much underlying the, the beginning of our space law treaties, but what about today? So, we're not thinking just about um, the Reagan-era notion of Star Wars, when he talked about having a huge system of satellites and shields, um, the strategic defense initiative. At the time, the technology wasn't sufficient to create something like that. Um, and it was also criticized as creating a new arms race. But if you think about the way wars are fought, here on Earth sounds like such a funny way to say it, as if we're fighting one other planets. But terrestrial warfare is already, um, I wouldn't say government, there's a lot of military technology that, that has an uh, extremely important part in how intelligence is gathered, for instance. Um, I know some people talk about Operation Deadly Storm in the first era of war as being the first space war. It was the first time that space technology and satellite technology was such an integral part of being able to uh, exercise the operation and, uh, and take strategic decisions. And the biggest question, which takes me to my next, uh, next question or next topic, is this idea of dual-use te technologies. So I mentioned GPS started out as military technology and became civilian, but what we also have today is it costs a lot of money to put things up in space. So there's a lot of um, shared payloads, there's a lot of dual use, so there are satellites up there that are used both for military intelligence gathering or monitoring and for you and I using our mobile phones, both on the one satellite. Um, so this creates questions as to what is the nature or use of that object? Can it be seen as a military object? Can it be targeted or not? So if we're thinking about to what extent international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict does or doesn't apply to space, or more to the point, to what extent do we know that it applies? What are the questions we still have to answer? So the Outer Space uh, Treaty and the other treaties applying to outer space are lex specialis. But as has already been mentioned, so is the law of armed conflict. So what happens if the two of those counter each other in any way? Which one prevails? It's one of the biggest questions we have to consider. Another problem is that it's not just new methods and means. So there's a big crossover with cyber warfare. Um, again, because most of the technology is satellite technology, but when we think about targeting a satellite, it's going to be done through cyber technology. So there's a lot of crossover with the questions that has been dealt with in the Tyler Manu, but also applies to space. Um, we have another question about territoriality. As I mentioned, no one can appropriate space. 
Um, and this was very much a hypothetical that came up a couple of weeks ago. I'd be very curious to see what our managing experts say about this. But in airspace, you can extend... Uh, it's not a claim of territorial, but it's an air defense identification zone. So beyond your exclusive economic zone, you could say, we want to extend another couple of hundred kilometers, and we want to say it's not our territory, but if anyone flies through that zone, we want you to identify who you are and what your purposes are, because there's a risk you may fly into our territory. So it's not a territorial claim, but it's an extension of a defense zone. Um, and there's been contentions around whether these zones can overlap each other, I'm curious whether we could think about the analogy of extending that upwards. So airspace, a uh, state has exclusive territory over its airspace up to we don't really know where, because we don't really know where airspace ends and outer space begins. It's another question that plagues uh, a few smart professors who still haven't been able to work it out. Would it be possible for a state to extend its, uh, not its territoriality, but its defence zone further up into outer space and say, if you fly through this zone, we want you to identify yourself? The problem is that then comes into contention with the freedom of use in outer space. Everyone has the right to freely explore outer space, and if you're suddenly claiming that I have to identify myself as I fly through a certain area that isn't your territory, it could become quite complex. But we're not only thinking about uh, in terms of war in space. I mean, it kind of sounds a little bit futuristic, but there's three domains you could think of. So the first is from space to Earth. So as I said, Operation Desert Storm, they've been using um, satellite technology for intelligence gathering and monitoring for quite some time. So space assets to contribute to or take part in terrestrial warfare. <clears throat> The second is Earth to space assets. So when we start thinking about the possibility of targeting a belligerent um, party satellite, and then the quite problem we have of dual use satellites and identifying whether this is actually a more military object or not, um, cyber warfare, but also possibly just jamming the signals so it wouldn't have to lead to destruction of a space asset. It could just be jamming the signal so that our enemy party can't receive the information that they're trying to get from that satellite. And then you can think about space to space, which is probably a little bit more futuristic at the moment, but it may not be too far off. Um, when you're thinking about using satellites as weapons against each other, um, or just with the purpose of interfering with each other. So in 2014, Russia launched a object. It didn't uh, announce the launch. It didn't register it. We don't know whether it was a satellite. People started to think it was just some kind of experiment. And then the satellites started to make some very interesting maneuvers moving towards other satellites. Now, it, it could also have been a really great step forward in terms of being, to do, uh, being able to do on orbit servicing and fixing a satellite or extending its life by sending this little robot out. But there was also speculation that it may have been a weapon test. We just don't know. So given, I mentioned, given the technologies, there's some crossover with cyber warfare, and the questions arise again in the space domain, what amounts to an armed attack? Um, what amounts to a use of force if you're talking about jamming or interfering a signal? Is that use of force? And what would then be the acceptable countermeasures for something like that? Are we just going to end up jamming each other's satellites continually? Um, and as many of you know, one of the core principles of law around conflict is the principle of distinction. So we have to be able to distinguish between military objects and protected objects, as Duncan mentioned, a hospital or a school, um, but also protected persons as opposed to um, military personnel or those directly participating in hostilities. So when we think about astronauts, for instance, the astronauts on the International Space Station, astronauts under Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty are uh, dedicated as envoys of humankind. They have a special protection. We all need to look after them. And there's also the astronaut agreement. So if a Russian astronaut lands on U.S. territory, the U.S. is obliged to help them out and return them to, uh, to Russia. Um, but what happens to the status of these astronauts if their two countries suddenly enter into conflict? Are they still envoys of humankind? Do they, a lot of these astronauts tend to be military personnel. Do they suddenly become um, military objects? Do they, do they retain a certain protection, which, like specialists, applies? What happens if an astronaut is not a military personnel? We have more and more people paying for their own uh, route to the ISS, but we also have scientists taking part in these uh, expositions. What if they're not military personnel, but they're involved in the use of space, space technologies? How do we know at what stage they are or aren't directly participating in hostilities and when their status might change? 
Um, and I mentioned already dual use satellites. I think this is one of the biggest questions that has to be answered when looking at targeting. A military object is defined, or if I use the wording of the uh, additional protocol, AP1, according to its nature, location, purpose, or use. Well, the location in outer space is not in anybody's territory. Um, the use and the purpose may be very difficult to identify when we have these dual use satellites. It becomes very difficult to identify what is or isn't a military target. And the same again with, uh, with rockets and launch vehicles. Essentially, every single launch vehicle sending satellites up into space is a missile. And it's very difficult to verify what its purpose is when it's launching. It may just be launching a little CubeSat that some university has developed for scientific purposes, or it may also be carrying another payload that we can't verify. Another big question is the balance of military necessity and collateral damage. These are the biggest questions in a lot of armed conflicts. Um, when you think about targeting a satellite, and, and I mentioned these dual use, so maybe the same satellite that I use to help me with my GPS to find the university today also has transponders on it that's being used for military purposes. If it were determined that it was a military object and that it was okay to target it, and then I'm talking more than just jamming the signal but possibly destroying the, the satellite, what happens in terms of collateral damage? If our communications were wiped out, and we have had a conference not long ago that was called um, Satellites Without Satellites for a Day, just imagine what our... We are so dependent on space technology, people don't really realise it, but... Our, our GPS communication is also used, for instance, for civil aviation, so you, the plane knows where it's going and where to land. Um, you know, all your internet communications, your phone communications, it's not just a matter of Facebook. There's actually some very serious technology that's dependent that if that were to be interrupted, even just temporarily, the collateral damage could be immense. So it's very hard to balance out whether that is a serious military object or not. Uh, sorry, whether that fulfills military necessity or not. Is it even foreseeable what the, what the collateral damage could be? And then again, our specific problem with space debris, if you are talking about kinetic weapons or destroying a, uh, a satellite or another space asset, the problem of space, space debris and the, the, the kind of extended greater risk for collision, I mentioned the film Gravity, but there's something like 100 potential collisions a day with the amount. We have 1,200 satellites up there, plus all the other space junk. If you were to destroy satellites, satellites and create more space junk, the environmental collateral damage would also be immense. So just briefly, how would a manual contribute to all of this? Well, Duncan's already mentioned the history of the manuals that we have, the San Remo manual, the, the Oxford manual historically, the Talon manual. These manuals are actually on the desks of military commanders when they're asking the questions in times of conflict. I don't know if the Talon manual has been actively used uh, thus far, but these manuals are important documents put together by the people with the inside knowledge. Um, we also need international rather than domestic rules. So one way about, of going about this might be that uh, national militaries come up with their own manuals um, to deal with these issues. But then you have a potential for different interpretations, crossing over legal regimes, um, a subjective interpretation as to when it might be triggered, which was what we had in the pre-World War II classical law of armed conflict. Uh, an international manual, recognized manual, would also avoid the problem of legal black holes, as I like to call them, which is when a state says, well, it's a state of emergency, we don't have to apply the law of armed conflict the way that it otherwise would apply. Um, Having an, an internationally recognized manual would avoid this, this potential problem. Um, and there's also a need for particular rules rather than just general principles. So we can't just rely on something like the Martins Clause, which was originally in the Hague Convention in 1907. It was uh, also included in the additional protocols. In cases not covered by the law in force, the human person remains under the protection of the principles of humanity and the dictates of the public conscience. The point was that you can't foresee all of the technology that humanity is going to develop. We need a clause that says, well, there's a general human standard that applies, but I'm not convinced that's enough when we're talking about this specific technology and this specific environment, which is very different from anything we've dealt with in land, uh, air, or sea warfare. We also need more clarity because there's an increasing number of non-state actors taking part in our space activities. Um, sharing launches with the government or mil military, dual use of technologies I mentioned, but also government and military outsourcing some of their, their, their technology. 
and we all know SpaceX is sending people up to the International Space Station, there's more and more of these non-state actors involved. How does the law of armed conflict apply to their participation should a, con a conflict begin between states? Um, and then there's a question, are we developing the law, updating the law, or are we restating the law? And, and I think it's probably something we can discuss a little bit further in time when we have questions. Um, essentially, the reason we need a manual is that it's about regulating and restraining the ways in which space is used in conflict, regulating and restraining military activities in space. The phase on death of the law of armed conflict is to regulate and minimize the impact of human conflict. And this needs to be considered carefully, and I would argue urgently, when it comes to the next battlefield. Thank you very much. Um, and last but certainly not least is uh, Pete Hayes, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about how clarifying some of this might be useful from a strategic context. Well, thanks very much, Brian. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and um, I appreciate this opportunity. I'd like to thank the uh, Secure World Foundation and uh, GW and uh, Duncan and all of you for uh, coming out to this. I need to also just reiterate that I'm also under those same kind of restrictions, so uh, these are personal comments only, and they don't reflect anyone's uh, official position about anything. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Of course. So, um, I, I would like to start with um, um, just the disclaimer that I am not a space lawyer. I don't play one on TV, so I probably have a quite uh, different interpretation of some of the things that have been uh, previously discussed. And I'd like to go back to... Uh, my interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty uh, based on what I see as the negotiating history um, as well as the subsequent practice of the party. So um, I think there was some thought to uh, the idea that we wanted to have uh, constraints on a potential arms race in space that led to uh, the Outer Space Treaty, but I would submit it was much more about, in that time era, about um, decolonization um, ideas that were uh, very widely shared among the states in the UN, and they wanted to ensure that the uh, ills of colonization would not be extended to outer space. So that's really the primary um, purpose behind the treaty as I see it. And I think when it, um, as Professor Steele mentioned, um, you know, you had a lot of rapid growth in space law in about the 10 years from the uh, opening of the space age. And subsequent to that, there's been very, very little. So I would submit that that's because the uh, major space actors reached the limits of what they were willing to agree to at the time of the Outer Space Treaty. They enshrined that into international law. And it's no accident, comrades, that we haven't gotten very far past that. So what exactly does the Outer Space Treaty say about space weaponization? It does not say that you cannot weaponize space. It says you can't have nuclear weapons in Earth orbit, outer space, or on celestial bodies. So uh, as the authoritative source for that, I submit to you that when um, Dean Russ testified in the United States Senate, uh, when they were doing advice and consent to ratification of the treaty, he said that this treaty does not preclude the development of anti-satellite weapons should those become necessary in the future. The United States had already developed anti-satellite weapons starting in 1958. So he was just merely stating a fact. There's nothing about anti-satellite weapons in the treaty. And again, in my judgment, in terms of the negotiating record, record and the subsequent practice of the parties, there's really nothing about that kind of weaponization of space. And I would also highlight, as Professor Steele did, that weapons of mass destruction are not defined in the treaty, so what is and isn't a mass destruction weapon is up to the space lawyers. To my mind. So, um, I, I, I mean, I would also tell you that, I mean, look, the uh, Soviet Union has tested their core orbital ASAT system 20 times, at least. The United States tested many anti-satellite weapons. Um, no one objected, to the best of my knowledge, to those events under the terms of the Outer Space Treaty because it could not. It doesn't prohibit those kind of things. So that's a very significant uh, point of international law here. We might like that the treaty banned all these kind of things. We might think that that's a better way to approach things going forward in the future. But in point of fact, it does not. And uh, again, practice of the parties is very important in this regard because they clearly interpreted that 
they could do those kind of things and not be in violation of the treaty. I would also submit to you that when states are really serious about um, having better defined and enforced mechanisms with respect to it, um, how the treaty will be implemented, they put in place something like the Standing Consultative Commission of the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Joint Inspection and Compliance Commission of the uh, START-1 Treaty, those kind of things, which are specifically intended to interpret what the uh, obligations under the treaty are and to uh, get the parties uh, on board with those kind of obligations. The Ashley Treaty has zippy duda with respect to that none. Okay, so that's a very significant point of departure as well. If the parties were really serious about having those kind of things in place, they would have put something in place, or in these many years subsequent to the treaty, they would have said, hey, you know, all this prior notification stuff and uh, 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 responsibilities for continuing supervision of all the activities of our, of our uh, licensees in space that require some kind of standing body to interpret all this stuff and uh, make sure that the signatories are um, in compliance with the terms of the treaty. Okay, so that is also <coughs> instructive to me. Um, so again, in my humble opinion, we've reached the limits in international law in terms of what uh, major space actors are willing to sign up to in terms of treaty law. Uh, customary international law is also important, as a, my uh, fellow panelists have talked about. Um, so again, the practice of the party is pretty important. Um, I note that none, at least to the best of my knowledge, I know there's a lot of uh, State Department's uh, people here, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of anyone that objected to, let's say, the 2007 uh, Chinese um, anti-satellite tests in terms of that somehow violating the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, obviously, the Chinese didn't do any prior consultations. Uh, you know, it seems to me that adding 25% to the amount of debris in lower Earth orbit might cause some kind of uh, harmful interference with others, but you know, it wasn't objected to on the grounds of somehow violating the treaty. So I think that ought to be instructed to us as well. Um, so that just forms a pretty uh, significant uh, impediment in my judgment in terms of um, where we're going with uh, specific law. I'd like to just highlight a couple other things that were uh, brought up by my panelists, and I um, am going to yield a lot of my time back because I'm very curious about your uh, questions. So uh, Duncan talked about um, peace being the normal state of affairs. Uh, that's another thing that I wish were true. But our friends in, um, in the Kremlin uh, seem to have other ideas about that. In fact, they come up with this idea of hybrid warfare. The uh, primary purpose of hybrid warfare is to blur the lines between peace and war so that many activities can be undertaken. And it doesn't really, un it's not very clear to many of the um, observers what exactly is going on. Maybe there's terrorist activities going on. Maybe there's unconventional warfare activities going on. Maybe conventional warfare activities with volunteers instead of regular forces, et cetera, et cetera. So um, w when we look at uh, major uh, space power actors who have these kinds of doctrines in operation terrestrially, it doesn't give me great um, optimism when I think about how those might be applied in space, especially in the context of all the um, issues with dual-use systems and problems with attribution that have already been raised. It's difficult enough when um, people are really interested in being transparent and um, providing as much information as possible about their space operations because space is big, it's hard to track all this stuff, smaller and smaller things can have more and more um, ability to uh, do more and more things. So um, when I overlay that with this idea that um, I now want to practice hybrid warfare and uh, fuzz up the line between peace and war, I think that's going to be very, very difficult. And I don't want to misconstrue my concepts. I wish everyone in this room and others the best of luck in producing these space law advancements. I really truly believe they are needed, but um, I just want to highlight that in my judgment it's going to be exceptionally difficult. The final thing I'll just raise is that um, uh, many of you have probably read uh, Clay Moltz's book, uh, Politics of Space Security, Strategic Restraint and National in the Pursuit of National Interests. So 
I think that's a brilliant book. It does a great job of talking about how the superpowers during the space age uh, did environmental learning and understood that um, lighting off nuclear weapons in space was harmful to uh, people in space and um, uh, more and more degree was less and less useful to folks. So I, I agree with all that. Um, I think Clay kind of runs history forwards and backwards because I don't think the concerns that um, we have about those things today were as big a concern at the time those things were happening. But I would just ask you to consider whether, in fact, this um, strategic restraint on the part of the United States is having the intended effect. It would be great if all other major space actors were practicing a lot of restraint in what they are capable of doing, as the United States has been doing for decades. But um, I don't see much evidence of that. And in the context of the interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty uh, that I just gave you and uh, the lack of other international law instruments to um, at least slow down this kind of thing, um, I think it's incumbent on us to rethink whether this is a uh, useful approach. And I would submit to you that um, when we don't have any kind of legal restraints, when our practice of strategic restraint has not been reciprocated by our primary uh, adversaries, it's time to um, think about doing this in another way. During the Cold War, as you're probably familiar, the United States, uh, during several occasions, uh, pursued what's known as a uh, two-track arms control approach. So probably the most famous example of that was with international or uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, INF forces so-called. Uh, I had the pleasure of delivering many of those warheads to Europe uh, when I was back in the Air Force. But um, anyways, what the United States said is, hey, we're either going to reach an agreement on these things or we're going to deploy them. So it's your choice. The Soviet Union had already deployed SS-20s into Europe. That was the proximate cause for the uh, ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing II missiles that the United States deployed in Europe. So um, that actually wasn't successful. We don't you know, um, have a specific um, treaty with respect to um, space in that regard. We did get an INF treaty, so that was very important. And it was also um, the first one where we had um, on-site inspections uh, and not just uh, national technical means. So, um, and as long as they brought up national technical means, I, I meant to mention this earlier, but some people make the case that um, because uh, under the terms of the um, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty of 1972, and the, um, I forget which article that is, but it talks about you're, you're not supposed to interfere with national technical means, euphemism for spy satellites, uh, first uh, introduced in that treaty. Um, that, that somehow extends to all other space stuff, and um, you can't do that, it's, it's bad. Uh, I would submit to you that, uh, first of all, we've withdrawn from that treaty, as you know. Uh, that treaty language has been reiterated in other treaties. But uh, if you go back and look at the actual language, it's very carefully crafted. It says um, that you're not supposed to interfere with national technical means when they are verifying compliance with the terms of this agreement. So my question to you is, how does one know whatever this space object is, is uh, <coughs> verifying compliance with whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing? So extending that kind of thin protection over all other space objects would, would be a, an extremely uh, thin read, in my humble opinion. So I'm going to shut that off there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so in the time we have left, I'm going to open up for questions and answers. Uh, I will ask that uh, you wait for the microphone to come around, and please state your name and affiliation uh, when uh, you're giving your question. Uh, so, uh, it's behind you. No, this mic's coming to you. Thank you. I'm Rob Ramey from the uh, Big Quarters Air Force, uh, working in international law. A couple of you mentioned the notion of uh, uh, Lex Specialis and the principles that that entails, particularly Dr. Steer and Duncan. Um, so I wanted to see what you think of this. It's, 
to the extent that we could articulate a conflict between outer space law and the law of armed conflict, and maybe envoys of mankind is a good one. You mentioned that as a possible example. But even there, uh, I don't think the either the Outer Space Treaty or the Rescue and Return Agreement, one, uses the term astronaut or cosmonaut. I think it's uh, spacecraft personnel, uh, which isn't defined. So what what is that? Just like space object, just like outer space, there's so many undefined terms. But to the extent we could find a real conflict, what, don't you think it more likely that the U.S. and other big major space actors would try to interpret international legal rights and obligations in such a way that they are consistent rather than inconsistent and therefore create a conflict and, and need to invoke the Lex Specialis principle? And maybe, Gary, since you're sitting there, maybe there's a, a, an application to cyber as well whatever law may govern that domain, if it's even a domain. <laughs> uh, thanks, sir, for the question. Thanks, sir, for the question. A very good question. The um, Lex Specialis, of course, only applies to the extent of any consistency, which is, uh, I think, what your point is, is if we can find consistency, then why not find consistency? And we'd prefer to, to do that. I, I think... Um, uh, the Outer Space Treaty does actually use astronaut, but all of the other treaties use spacecraft personnel. Um, I think it may be possible to, to argue that there is consistency between astronauts being envoys of mankind um, and the application of the law of armed conflict. Uh, the, but, but that's part of the reason maybe we need to clarify these sorts of things. But you can imagine circumstances where they're given a special status in, in international law. Uh, and and um, I, I think it would be relatively easy to argue that notwithstanding that they might be from the military, military originally, um, while they're astronauts, they're civilian personnel um, and therefore protected. Um, I think that's all I'll say on that and pass it over to others. I mean, all I would say is I, I agree absolutely. Inconsistency doesn't necessarily mean uh, conflict between the terminology. The point is more, indeed, to raise where there's lack of clarity. And I think that's one of the reasons we need a manual is because the questions come up, we don't quite know exactly what happens to those undefined terms. Um, and I agree totally. More often than not, you could find harmony within that rather than conflict, rather than trying to decide which of the two prevails. Um, but it requires, it requires clarity because there isn't. There isn't clarity at the moment. Linda Billings, I'm a consultant to NASA's near Earth Object Observation Program, and I have a question about planetary defense and options for uh, deflecting or destroying asteroids on an impact course with Earth. Now, what sort of legal regime would apply? Uh, and I'm going to make this U.S. only, just to keep it simple. It isn't simple. Uh, if the U.S decided to launch a nuclear weapon, which of course we now call nuclear devices, but a repurposed nuclear weapon on a rocket uh, from a launch pad in the United States uh, to deflect or destroy an asteroid. And this would be in deep space, of course, on an impact course with Earth. And also, what kind of legal regime would apply and what kinds of issues could you foresee coming up, uh, particularly with non-U.S. actors? Um, and would the legal regime and the issues raised be different if the mission were a civilian mission, say NASA, or a military mission, say DOD? Uh, another great question. Um, I'm glad that it's been asked. Um, it would very definitely um, give rise to questions about the application of the doctrine of necessity in, in international law. Seems to fit squarely within it. The, the criteria are, are, are that there is a grave and imminent peril threatening an essential interest of the state, the only way for the state to safeguard against it, but it can't seriously impair an essential interest of another state to which an obligation is owed, um, and um, it can't be invoked if the international obligation in question excludes it or the state has contributed to the situation of necessity. Uh, so it seems to me that, that it fits squarely within it. 
there, there is, um, you, you hear the phrase American exceptionalism, and it's a little uncomfortable being an Australian and raising that phrase in this <laughs> forum. But um, if ever there was a case for American exceptionalism, then something like this seems to fit well within it. You know, frankly, there's, there's not a lot of others that would be able to do something about an asteroid headed towards this planet. Now, of course, there would be differences in the international community about the means used to do something about the asteroid, um, but I, I think it's unlikely that anybody but the United States could do something about it. So, again, so you also asked what would the difference be if it were a military or a civilian operation. As I said, Article 6 of the Earth Space Treaty says that states are responsible for all national activities, even if that's uh, a non-state activity by an organisation which is under the control or jurisdiction of that state. So you just apply state responsibility as we know it to be in international, public international law, um, which would mean you'd have to fulfil these questions of necessity and... Um, this year, the, uh, actually just this weekend past, the Manfred Lax uh, Space Law Moot Court competitions were placed here in DC, the North American Rounds. And the problems that had to, the students had to deal with was exactly the scenario you're describing. Um, so perhaps you could speak to some of those students about the solutions they came up with. But the majority of them argued exactly this, that you would have to fulfill the requirements of necessity, you'd have to look at attribution if it weren't actually a military operation. Um, but, but I think... The point is, it's a, a bad luck in saying that nuclear weapons, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, in terms of the legal, legal regime applicable, the ICJ has also, the International Court of Justice has also said in an advisory opinion about the legality of nuclear weapons, though they are illegal because they're by definition weapons of mass destruction, there may be an exception if it's a case of um, total emergency self defense, and you could imagine that this scenario might fall under that. So I'll just add to that, not as a lawyer, but as somebody who's about the bit of the technology. Uh, I think you can make a distinction between a nuclear weapon and a nuclear explosive device, just like you can make a distinction between a thousand pounds of dynamite used for a mining expedition and a thousand pounds of high explosive packaged into a bomb with a casing designed to focus it and create shrapnel. Um, and I, a weapon is something designed to have specific effects in a specific military context. Uh, and a, a nuclear weapon uh, would have to be significantly re-engineered in most cases to be useful against the kind of deflection scenario you're talking about. Um, and then I think that would raise a very interesting question then, is it still a nuclear weapon or not? Or is it to fall into this new category of a nuclear explosive device? But, uh, sorry. Victoria Sampson, Secure World Foundation. Um, I have one question for the space people and one for the cyber guy. Um, space people, uh, I'm relatively familiar with this issue in terms of the legal aspects of this, but one of the things I've been hearing more and more often is the idea that with the 50th anniversary of the Outer Space Treaty coming up, now is a great time to start looking back at it. Um, my concern, and I'm kind of with Pete on this, is I think maybe issues that weren't brought up in the first time around we're not done for a reason, and by starting to discuss it again, you're opening up a can of worms. Maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to hear your opinions on that. Um, because we're seeing it specifically in regards to the concept of defining self-defense in space that we're seeing looking at it. Um, and then um, in terms of cyber, I was really interested to hear you talk about escalation leading to kinetic conflicts. Because for space, that's one of the big issues we look at. How do you send the proper message so that escalation doesn't happen, at least not without intent? And I'm curious to know. Yes, I resolved that issue. Thank you. <laughs> so, do you want to go first here? Uh, might be a simple answer. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, Cyber solved all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> all the answers. The uh, there, there's been talk about having a, a hotline, for instance. Um, you know, it's just to keep communications going and that kind of thing. The, the United States uh, answered to it. In 2011, in its international strategy for cyberspace, the U.S. said, uh, to, to paraphrase, some things in cyber, we're not going to tell you what, we'll consider to be aggressive acts and won't respond like we would to any other aggressive act against us. <clears throat> so that, that's kind of been the clearest statement from any country about uh, uh, escalation or what would be considered an aggressive act in cyberspace. So not especially useful, although... Um, you know, obviously the U.S. engaging in some strategic ambiguity there. It wasn't that they didn't know they were being unclear. It's that, you know, you don't necessarily want to show your entire hand to, the, to your adversaries, potential adversaries. 
So, uh, no, uh, we don't have a lot of answers yet. And until we define what, certainly until we define what an attack is, what a use of force is, what an armed attack is in cyber, I think you're not going to have a clarity on that issue. So, are we opening up another can of worms? I mean, yes, and, but it needs to be opened up. And I think part of the problem is I'm not convinced that we're going to get states to sit down and create an um, Space Treaty 2.0 or, um, or, or update it or create a new treaty. There's a reason that there's been that deadlock also within the uh, UN Committee for Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is that states have been unwilling around certain issues to... to um, bind themselves to hard law, um, which is why you know, there's a discussion about what, whether soft law is law, but um, sometimes the draft articles on state responsibility might be one really good example. Sometimes it works more effectively not to push to have it become a treaty. The draft articles on state responsibility were, were drafted over carefully over quite a couple of decades by the International Law Commission. Um, and the content, particularly of some of those uh, articles, is harder than what states would agree to if they were to come to the table together. And yet it's become recognised as customary international law. The International Court of Justice has referred to them many times. Just a few weeks ago, they've actually stated that the entire draft articles are now recognised as customary law and not just certain articles. Um, so there may be some ways of developing these issues, particularly when it comes to... <clears throat> using space as a battlefield and what do we do with law of armed conflict. We're not dependent on trees. We also have customary law, which is hard law. Um, and then we also have soft law and we also have things like, you know, it's stated here on the cover of the Talent Manual, prepared by the international group of experts that was put together under the, the umbrella of, uh, of the NATO cyber defense, uh, let me see, center of excellence, <laughs> under NATO I wanted to say, but it's not, it's not a NATO exercise, it's an international exercise, there are international experts involved, um, military experts, public international experts, law of armed conflict experts, and these are the kinds of people you need to get sitting at a table to state the law in a manual that military commanders can then go and use to then form state practice to form customary law over time. It's a different way of forming the law. Trying to get the states together now in the next few years to create another treaty is, is unlikely. Perhaps you want to add <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is one of the $64 million questions in terms of, you know, what it, whether it would be better to try that approach or more of this bottom-up approach that um, most of the uh, major spacefaring actors have been um, pursuing subsequent to the Outer Space Treaty. Um, in, in my judgment, the number one thing that really isn't um, effectively addressed in the Outer Space Treaty isn't even so much the security issues as the commercial issues of space. Um, and in that regard, um, maybe there are some useful precedents with respect to um, letting commercial actors into the International uh, Telecommunications Union as well as the uh, COPUIS. So, um, I, I would say that it would be useful if um, there was an attempt to do this kind of top-down approach, you know, in conjunction with the 50th anniversary or whenever, if those kind of commercial actors could be explicitly brought into the regime, because I think uh, more and more they have um, uh, the majority of activity, and what they do is really, really important, and having a regulatory regime that everyone can agree to with respect to their activities is uh, critically important. And for those of us who'd like to see a lot more um, kind of deep space commercial operations, I would submit that that's critically important because right now there isn't a um, guarantee of any kind of reward commensurate with the risk undertaken by those parties. So no one's willing to uh, entertain those kind of risks unless there's better assurance that they're going to get some kind of payout um, if in fact there is a payout. Can I reattack sure, on that absolutely. as well? So may, maybe this is sort of the new normal in uh, the development of international law because I'm hearing a lot of parallels with the, the, the lack of development of law in cyber, uh, cyber warfare as well. There really isn't any serious discussion about a treaty, an international treaty happening with uh, cyber warfare. Heck, we can't even uh, agree on domestic law in, in uh, cyberspace, so it's really going to be difficult to get countries together. So the most interesting work now is being done on uh, what, what's being called cyber norms. Um, I'm, I'm not 
sure they meet the definition of what I would have called norms five years ago, but <laughs> but uh, they're more they're aspirations essentially because you know let's face it we have norms in cyberspace we just don't like them uh, because it's do whatever you can get away with right I mean that's that's what people have been doing since the beginning of the internet so that's what people continue to do but we're trying to establish some some. Uh, polite behavior, some standards of polite behavior in cyberspace, and that interesting work being done there uh, internationally, so maybe that's the way it'll go, and maybe something similar will happen in, uh, in space as well. Can I just... Mm -hmm. on, on the question of a, I, I guess, um, a hierarchy of um, norms or, or rules in international law, if you have states sign up to a treaty, then that has a high level of value, quite a lot of strength, quite a lot of cachet, if you like. Um, but then there is measures short of that, such as getting a group of international legal experts together. Uh, and um, one of the measures of success of something like that is, is it actually used practically? And the San Remo Manual of International Law Applicable to Armed Conflicts at Sea, as I say, to my knowledge... Um, any naval warfare officer knows of the San Remo Manual. Now, um, it's not a treaty document, but the practical effect is, is quite strong. Um, and it's, it's part of what has sometimes been called the secret life of international law. It's a good phrase that I like. The other thing about um, the sort of levels of international law below treaty level is um, there can be some cynicism about any, any international law but if you don't have international law on, on your side then you risk um, not having domestic support and you know having the wrong message going throughout the Twitter sphere you risk not being able to get the hosting um, bases in, in other states when you're trying to form a military coalition. You risk not being able to get the military coalition that you want. You risk not being able to get the resolution that you want with the UN Security Council um, and you risk no support from other members of the international community in, not, in, in being able to support other diplomatic measures like sanctions and, and those sorts of things. But perhaps the most significant thing is that until you have norms, until you say you can't do this, then you can't point to another state and say you've crossed a threshold and now we have a right to do something about it. If there are no norms, you just can't do that. Jim? Oh, sorry. Uh, Richard East, in, independent scholar. I wanted to make a comment about GPS. Uh, points been making that it started out as a military system, which is a common misconception, but GPS from the very beginning, uh, the Block 1 satellites had civilian signal as well as military, and Professor Richard Langley, who writes a column for GPS World, uh, made the comment that in 1982 he was using the civilian signal, so that was a year before the Korean airliner was uh, shot down, so it's it's a common misconception that Reagan opened up GPS for civilian applications, but that's not correct. From the very beginning, it had a civilian signal. The problem is only the Department of Defense was willing to fund it. So, so that may be where the misconception comes from. And the predecessor system transit quickly had civilian applications. Jim Armour with Orbital ATK, but longtime Air Force member, and it's taken me a while to get out of the national security mindset and into the commercial world, but now very interested in satellite servicing and the longer term um, asteroid mining and other logistics that you find in space. Um, I don't really have a well-formed question, but um, an observation as we've worked some of these advanced commercial projects is that what we're really looking for is stability that we can work within. We don't really care in a lot of ways what the rules are as long as there's rules. And we have been, found a great deal of success working within the U.S. domestic framework, you know, State Department, ITU, 
FAA, FCC, all of those frameworks have um, been flexible enough to deal with the new kinds of businesses we're bringing forward. And I think we're sort of looking for the U.S. government then to turn into the international domain and then set the norms that we're working on um, at a global level. Um, that's sort of hope springs eternal. I mean, I'm not sure how it's going to work out, but I would be afraid to get commercial entities involved in the international forums because they are very focused on you know, their own interests, and um, those can drive less than um, humanitarian <laughs> objectives, which I would hope the larger goals uh, would, would attain. Um, so I guess my question might be, um, we've had some success in Law of the Seas, and I, I don't hear too much discussion about that kind of a, an approach for the space domain, and I'm just surprised by that. Maybe it's ongoing and I haven't seen it, um, but I would be interested in comments to any of the comments that I made. Thanks. Um, addressing the, the question about Law of the Sea uh, first, it's, it's a, an analogy that is often made in the space domain and uh, Cassandra and I were just at a conference um, last week where there was some suggestion that the concept of a contiguous zone, which is part of the Law of the Sea, could be extended into outer space. That has all sorts of challenges around it, but perhaps it's useful. But it would be a long way before we, long time before we saw anything about that. In terms of um, commercial involvement in, in, in the space domain and particularly the, the strategic and, and security aspects of the space domain, um, it, it was, a, it was a, something that I discussed specifically at, the, at this conference last week, and, and there are three C's that I'm sure many of the space community would have heard about, that space is becoming more congested, contested and competitive. Um, I suggest that there are three, four R's that should be the response to that, and that is that space needs to become more regulated, more resilient, more redundant, and there needs to be repercussions in outer space. Um, and commercial entities could contribute to every one of those. The challenge, though, would be to contribute to one of those without undermining another. Oh, unsolicited, I realize. But I'll, I'll talk about the way the, the uh, law of the sea analogy has been uh, applied in cyberspace. People try to apply it all the time. We hear, we hear about it all the time in cyber. I, I think when you think about, because mostly we're, we're, we're thinking we'd like to develop a high seas principle where people can take, undertake activities where they don't bother other people and, and uh, that kind of thing is, is a big part of it. And the way we developed the high seas was first we, we define territorial sovereignty Right, and we, we define the sovereignty along all the sea coasts, and whatever's not sovereign territory is high seas. So the first thing you need to do is define where your territorial sovereignty. And so in cyberspace, people talk about this, and I think about, you know, who knows? Maybe somebody will correct me on being wrong all these years, but I I think uh, traditionally we talk about the law of the sea starting with a three mile wide territorial sea because why? Cannons, right? Yeah, it's the range of shore-based cannon, they say. So it's as far as you can protect your sovereignty. You can fire three miles, and that's how far uh, it extends. So, so the analogy I, I uh, offer in cyber to people is, okay, so your cyber sovereignty extends just as far as you can protect it. That's not much. Uh, maybe not any. So I, I don't know, and it even brings into question the entire uh, idea of having any kind of sovereignty in cyberspace or whether or not it has any... Uh, Characteristics in common with mapping your territorial sovereignty. So it's a it's a different question, but the same analogy applies. Everybody loves the law of the sea. It's a great body of law, uh, and we'd love to see it apply. I'm sure in space as well as site. Yeah, if you have a so good. Um, those are great questions, sir. And um, you know, it, it's very difficult to struggle with the best approaches to this, but. Um, I would just submit that, uh, to me, um, 
common heritage of mankind provisions in um, the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty are the biggest distinction uh, between that and um, the Outer Space Treaty. I mean, the Outer Space Treaty has elements of that, but that term of art hadn't emerged at the time of, of that treaty. So, um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, how are you going to uh, divvy up any wealth generated in space? So, under common heritage of mankind, everyone has equal rights to that, whether they assumed any risk in its development or not. I mean, that makes sense for a lot of things, uh, maybe that don't require so much effort to uh, develop, but I think space does require a lot of developments to, um, or a lot of effort to develop. And um, I see those kind of um, uh, structures as being an impediment to doing more commercial development in space because, as I mentioned, I would like to see the people taking the risk getting the biggest potential benefits, and that would be um, not the case under common heritage. So, and the other thing I'll just mention is the seabed authority, you know, to do all this stuff under the law of the sea, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't really done anything, so, you know, it's all kind of theoretical in that domain as well. So um, perhaps as that matures and you get some more test cases on how that's really going to be um, developed and, and uh, who gets what, where, when, and how, then those things could be applied to space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Bob Lee Scott from NASA, following up on Mr. Armour's, General Armour's question, also a long-term Air Force. <laughs> For Professor Steer, uh, Article 6, as you mentioned, requires the states to oversee or approve it continuously and monitor the activities of governments and non-government. Uh, that's good in international law, but what about domestic law to regulate that sort of thing? There, there really isn't any, right? The perfect legal answer to any question like that is it depends. Um, actually, in the U.S., there's a great deal of regulation. Um, the U.S. has more domestic law governing space activities than any other state. Um, and, and for the most part, because originally it was only states who had the wherewithal to, to, uh, to, become, you know, to, en to enter these space activities, that's why that language is in, in the Outer Space Treaty. It wasn't foreseen that commercial actors would suddenly become the ones with the wherewithal and the technology. Um, but for the most part, states, and it does depend, India, for instance, has almost no regulation, and it's wanting to, and it is becoming a very successful space-faring nation. But, but where that regulation is there, states comply with their obligation under the Outer Space Treaty, and the organizations and uh, commercial entities within that state comply with their national regulations. So there's an immense amount of licensing regulation that goes on if you want to um, procure a satellite, finance a satellite, launch a satellite. Um, where is the risk uh, for the insurance risk? What happens if that satellite fails at launch? What happens if it crashes into another satellite? Regulating the uh, orbital slot, regulating the frequency. But, but, but so that's specifically uh, mining and uh, satellite services. Right. That's and that's and I agree that that so that still needs to be developed. Um, and it's I had a point I wanted to, to mention before as well that I think this is something that that I think will happen more and more first at a state level and then at international. Um, and the, so in the air space treaty, there is actually the notion of the province of all mankind, which may or may not have been with the same mindset as um, the heritage of all mankind in the law of the sea. But I think that is going to be one of our greater challenges. The, the FF, FAA has just said, we will license a company that wants to land on the moon and, and give you exclusive rights to that area that you're going to land on, even though the FAA of the US can't claim territory over the moon. So there's a... There's an interesting clash between regimes, and I think it will start at national and then go up to international, because states essentially, whether it be under the Outer Space Treaty or under um, principles of state responsibility in public, international, or in general, recognize their responsibility. So, um, so just to clarify that last point, um, uh, what was... So the, the actual FA response has not been published, which is why it's, it's hard to figure it out, but best we can tell what they said was the FAA will basically protect that company from interference with its activities by other FAA licensed entities um, which is totally within its power to do uh, but the question is what does that mean to non-FAA licensed entities other nations that's totally up for grabs um, 
Yeah, exactly. Um, we have one more time. Chris? Hi, Chris Johnson, Secure World. So I know that we uh, are trying to wrap it up, so I won't all pass it on uh, to the I try, Charles can try to keep it brief, but legal scholars and practitioners can usually make two categories of statements. We can make positive statements and normative statements, and positive statements merely find the law and report the content of the law, uh, black letter law, uh, custom and practice. They may also make uh, normative statements, uh, what the law should be, what the content of the law should be, uh, like a forendus, what the, the phrase is. When we look at existing domains for uh, military activities, um, these traditional manuals, it seems that those uh, there's a lot of activity and phenomena that they can derive positivist statements from. Moving into more um, speculative areas, cyber and outer space, my concern is that uh, we might be making more uh, normative recommendations. Uh, so is that something that was, how, did, how was this balanced <coughs> for cyber, and how could it possibly be balanced in the future as we consider, um, you know, uh, what is the definition of self-defense in space? What's the law of armed conflict for outer space? So uh, thanks to the panel. Yeah, we, we were uh, I th really cautious and I think pretty successful at only talking about the Lex Lata. I mean, the, we really did try to discuss the law as it is now and not the laws we think it ought to be or as it might be. Some of the some of the different ideas of the of the application of, ex of existing law, the disagreements are reflected in the commentary, but it's always uh, spelled out. I think so. This project very specifically was trying to apply applicable law, leaving the difficult part of deciding what the law ought to be in the future to somebody else. I think. I guess the only thing I would say is, is um, I, I think a similar approach would be good for a um, manual of international law applicable to military uses of outer space if one came to exist. But there is um, room for some discourse, if you like, about um, lex verenda, the law as it should be, um, and whether that takes place in the context of international legal experts getting together um, or, or not, I'm not sure, just so long as those legal experts are absolutely clear about when they're talking about the law as it is versus what they think the law should be. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to mention the McGill's application? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just checking whether I was information, unclassified information. Um, so... <laughs> McGill's Institute of Air and Space Law actually, with a great deal of Duncan's expert input, has made an application to get funding to develop a manual on the application of international law to military uses of outer space. And the hope would be that it would be along the same lines as the San Remo and Talon manual. And the kinds of people involved in that would be, as I mentioned before, you have to have the military experts, you have to have the public international law experts. Um, it's not, I don't think it's a forum where you know, someone asks me why is you know, the US president is the commander of chief, why is there no one representing the commander of chief of states or the heads of states on a, on a group like that? And my answer was because we're not writing a treaty. This is not about representing state will, <clears throat> because treaties are as much an expression of political will as they are of law creation. But what this is, is in the first place a clarification of the law, and you could call it a restatement. And I agree totally with, with Duncan that it's along the lines of what the International Law Commission does. Their uh, mandate is to clarify and progressively develop international law. They've been hesitant to progressively develop, but they've been explicit when they've done so. Um, this is not an International Law Commission coming together, but it's a body of experts who have the insight and the wherewithal to develop, to, to state the law and clarify the law where, as we spoke about, where there are inconsistencies or lack of clarity in the different lex specialis that apply. And there may be questions raised about where it could go, but I think at this stage we wouldn't be saying it's up to us to develop the law. All right, with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming, and please join me in thanking our speakers.